Hello, my name is Sarah Tyson, Associate Professor of Philosophy at the University of Colorado, Denver. I'm talking with Dr. David Hildebrand, Professor of Philosophy at CU Denver and Chair of the Philosophy Department, about how he is thinking about the pandemic using the tools and methods of philosophy. Welcome, David. Thanks for talking with me today. Oh, my pleasure. Good to be here. Um, will you start out by telling us a little bit about how you got into philosophy? So I took philosophy in college. I didn't have a chance to take it in high school, but I was interested in multiple things. I was interested in history. I was interested in literature and I was interested in philosophy. But the problem for me was that I was a very slow reader. And mm. so I, I love novels, but I couldn't read like a 500 page book a week. And um, I also loved uh, history, but, um, I think the combination of the speculative and general nature of philosophy, uh, along with sort of the close attention to texts and to thinking and dialogue with other people was what convinced me. Uh, so that's how I sort of got into it as, as a major. After college, I didn't know that I wanted to continue in philosophy. I actually just wanted to work in, in a job where I, I would have some opportunities to meet people and do creative things. And so I was working in the nonprofit arts area. And I realized that that was not going to be that remunerative or that safe. And uh, I also had a side interest as a jazz guitarist. And I even studied briefly with uh, Pat Martino, who was a jazz guitarist in Philadelphia. I studied with him for about a year in the late 80s. But uh, I realized that there was not much of a financial future either in the nonprofit arts world uh, or in jazz. So I went into philosophy as my backup. <laughs> because that's a, like a, a sure bet on the money making front. <laughs> it was safer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so that's when you decided to go to grad school? That's when I decided to go to grad school and I just applied uh, to, I think, seven different graduate schools. And uh, UT was the one that I got into and, uh, and I went there and it was a very diverse program. And that's where I you know, got a chance to study all different kinds of philosophy and, and go to Austin, which was a great place to be in the 90s. Yeah, and so um, fast forward to today, you are teaching a class on propaganda. And so I was wondering how that is influencing, teaching that class is influencing the way that you're thinking about the pandemic. And then I guess also the way the pandemic is influencing the way that you're teaching about propaganda. Yeah, so I guess just to talk about the approach to my I'm teaching an introduction to ethics class. It's called Ethical Reasoning at our school. And just to back up, I taught logic uh, several years ago. I mean, back in 2004 or so, 2005. And I always felt whenever I taught uh, logic that there was something missing. There was the context of reasoning was missing. And to my mind, the context of reasoning always includes the environment in which we're doing the reasoning, which for most of us includes media the visual appeals, the repetition, that kind of thing. And media is also a huge purveyor of propaganda. It's not all propaganda, obviously, but the tool of mass media is quite capable, whether it's through advertising, misinformation or disinformation uh, to purvey, mis you know, basically propaganda of different kinds. And we know that there are uh, economic structures behind the, these forces, and we know that there are implications for both the way we think, how we reason, the epistemology, and also for our democratic institutions. But I think there's also ways of analyzing the tactics that are deployed in media that affect the way we reason. And I think a lot of philosophers have shied away from this element of logic because they think they're on the argument side of the old rhetoric argument divide. And the way I see it, there, I realize teaching critical thinking or logic that there's no point in singing praises for philosophy or for argument if teachers are neglecting how we reason or do philosophy in the larger context in which our students live and have things thrown at them, have misinformation, propaganda, advertising, it's all mixed together for them. 
Uh, so a lot of philosophers teach logic, critical thinking, and they just can't understand why students don't get it. And I think the reasons they don't get it is partly because the media context and rhetoric is part of the environment in which uh, we, we, we reason. And so what I realized teaching logic was that in order to seek what it is, in order to seek a way to teach critical thinking to undergraduates, we have to talk about the social and environmental conditions for critical thinking. And, and the COVID-19 uh, times and the, the times we're living in just generally politically are time when critical thinking about values and democratic institutions is really urgent. So I decided to teach ethical reasoning as if it was sort of the modified logic class that I thought was necessary way back when. So uh, you also asked about how the sort of the news about COVID is influencing uh, how, how I'm, how my teaching of propaganda or teaching of ethical reasoning is influencing the way I'm taking in news about COVID. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, I think it's really influencing my own intake of that news. Uh, there are a lot of classic moves now. I now recognize the classic moves of propaganda. Whether Ooh, it, will you go through those? I would love a little like typology. Well, uh, there are a few that just rise to the top, and one is the the way that truth and falsity are mixed together. This is one of the most powerful ways to propagandize. It's not just to tell a hyperbole or or an exaggeration or just to scare people outright but it's to say some true things and say and then say some false things and mix them together uh so that that it's sort of up to the media to decide or the journalists to decide or the reading public to decide uh, how to evaluate it. And I think for most people, if there's a little bit of truth mixed in, it's really hard to declare the uh, what's just been uh, delivered to you as as false or as propaganda. So so that's one thing. And of course, there's constantly changing the subject, uh, figuring out what people need or want and, and, and mixing that in, whether it's talking about opening back up businesses or letting people get back to normal and so forth. Uh, so there are a lot of agendas that are getting advanced uh, I think under the cover of fear and misinformation, but I guess I can't give you a complete typology, but I think it's that. No, but that's really helpful. Yeah, yeah those the main ones you're seeing. Um, and what for you, are misinformation and propaganda, um, how are they related? Are so, they the same thing? Is well, one a form of the other? So I, I'm using a I'm using a textbook by um, by someone named Randall Marlin, and he's actually in his 80s now. He's a Canadian, and he studied with Jacques Lowe, and also he's a student of Orwell. So it's very interesting okay. mixture uh, of sort of a, a French Catholic sociologist philosopher from the 60s, who's actually a philosopher of technology also, and then or Orwell. Uh, but you know, it, so Lowell has a long um, sort of description or uh, umbrella description of propaganda, but it includes it, the, it includes a lot of different things which you think of public relations, advertising, um, disinformation, misinformation, lies, uh, just flat out lies. But the key element that makes it propaganda, the, the key to the definition is that it's bypassing the rational scrutiny of the listener in order to manipulate them. And, mm -hmm. and it doesn't necessarily it doesn't necessarily have to be evil. This is something that the class, my class sort of reacted to immediately, that they thought that all propaganda was necessarily evil. But you know, you can propagandize people into doing something about social distancing or about climate change or something like that. And then you have to have a moral debate as to whether or not the pluses and minuses of manipulation are worth it. Um, so we, we've talked about both sides of that. But yeah, yeah. So I could see if you want to get people to wear masks and isolate, you might think the best way to do that is just to scare them into that or to, you know, it's not about arguing them into it, right? It's about just getting them to do it. Right. It's like, there are lots of, you know, 
thought experiments, you know, does the captain of a ship have a general consensus meeting about what to do about the iceberg they just struck? You know, it, it may be that it's in the, everyone's best interest to manipulate people to get them into the lifeboats um, rather than having sort of an ideal communicative space as in a Habermas kind of way. Um, I always, I have to admit in those thought experiments, I'm like, well, why weren't we doing drills before we hit an iceberg? Exactly. You know? like, we can point this whole ethical dilemma of who to lie to and who to tell the truth if we just said icebergs are possible. We know that from past experience, so we're going to make sure we're ready. Yeah, no, it's it's true, and I think you know that's that's sort of the, when I tried to defend Habermas in that section of the the, the class, I, I tried to point out that he's trying to describe the ideal epistemic conditions for consensus or discussion, and if, if your aim is to have a democratic society, he's trying to describe those because he's trying to get us to start doing them now, <laughs> not yeah. not in a crisis. Yeah. Um, uh, but you, you know the other the other just thing just thing to mention about um, about COVID and and the virus and um, and propaganda is it seems like a natural time to try to apply the discussions we're having about propaganda directly to what's happening in the news with students. And I thought I would be doing that, and I'm actually not doing very much of that. I've done a, an extra credit assignment here or there, but I, I thought that. It's such a stressful topic that mm -hmm. it would be more important for them to continue to develop the basic lessons of how to analyze what they're hearing and to develop sensitivity for the tools for thinking rather than to try to quickly apply those tools to COVID as if it, it was going to shine this brilliant light and make everyone feel better. I think since we're in the middle of it, it's, it's better just to focus on like, well, you know, here's here's how to think about all information that's coming in. Yeah, to not make them also think about COVID in an exercise or in a class that we can do this on other topics that aren't quite so pressing minute to minute. Yeah, yeah I don't know what I'm gonna trigger, but um, we, yeah. we're also not meeting face to face at this point. So it's hard to gauge you know, how, how that information is, is being absorbed. Definitely. Well, in that, um, we are now all meeting remotely or we're doing things online. And I know you're a philosopher of technology um, and you, you largely approach that project through the lens of pragmatism. So uh, it might be helpful for you to just sketch what that looks like. And then if you just talk about how you're thinking about not just the way we're all on social media differently or we're doing more remote um, things, but are you thinking about technology in terms of ventilators, um, in terms of the kinds of models we can produce technically now? I just wondered where you, as a philosopher of technology, where your mind is going. Um, and so if you just talk a little bit about what it means to be a philosopher of technology as a pragmatist, especially, and then where your mind is going. So I guess for a pragmatist approach to technology, I think about technology in sort of Dewey sense, which is technology just means a way of doing things. And machines are one way of doing things. So the inclusion or the exclusion of ma machines and technology uh, is, is sort of besides the point. There are many ways to do things. And the question is always, what's the best way? Who is bettered or who is made worse? And how do we get to doing things better? So a, a lot of the problem with talking about technology, at least from the perspective of a pragmatist, is that um, technology in terms of the machines and the techniques in which the society is uh, enmeshed are they're super added to a, a lot of ways of doing things that we've already assumed are the right ways. So the COVID mm -hmm. situation really is eliciting, for me, technology's pluses and technology's dangers. So, I mean, the pluses we think about, is there a cure? How do we do tracing? How do we do treatment? The medical technologies, which are going to skyhook us out of this thing, are, uh, are a huge Plus, uh, the dangers include, well, how did it spread so quickly? I mean, it was here. It was probably here in the United States from what I last read as early as late December, or early January. 
And then it becomes a question, that then it raises the question of propaganda, because if that information was here, why wasn't it disseminated? Um, what was disseminated instead? But, uh, you know, how did it spread so quickly? Uh, what about bad testing? What's raised by the surveillance specters that are being put into play? And I think that the, what I've thought about technology by watching this virus is that the more we focus on uh, technology, whether we're focusing on the plus or the minus, the more we're obscuring the kinds of thinking which are necessary to do. Uh, and to me, that, that includes the social and economic uh, justice aspects, right? Who, look, look, at the, look at the inequalities that are raised by COVID. Who is going to the store and doing the shopping? Who is staying home? Who has healthcare? Who has a salary? Who is going bankrupt? How is aid being distributed, right? Is there a long-term plan to recover from this economically or epidemiologically? So, I mean, those are all non-technological questions. Mm -hmm. And the, the technological aspect of it, just to my, the way I see technology just reveals them. And I think, you know, if you combine both these te technological factors and the propagandistic factors, you get sort of the perfect storm for what no Naomi Klein likes to call the shock doctrine, right? So any crisis is an opportunity for either good or for evil changes to be implemented. And it's very hard to, uh, to know what kind of opportunity this is being presented, uh, that's being presented for people and what they're doing about it, particularly if the information we're getting isn't, uh, isn't balanced or at least isn't um, diverse. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the, all these issues, these social and economic issues, they, they can't really be, um, they can't be dealt with uh, and adjudicated during the crisis. I mean, we have to do the best we can and fight for what we already think is the right thing to do what, in terms of equity and justice. But as you were pointing out about the uh, preparing for an iceberg, uh, yeah. philosophical and ethical debates in an ongoing way as part of everyday life is what prepares us for a crisis so that we're not all of a sudden throwing people off their health care, whatever, whatever it is. And I mean, right. you probably part, we've prepared right cognitively and through through this kind of imaginative work prepared. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, I mean, every we all teach the apology or most people teach the apology mm -hmm. at some point. And students students love and this may be the only quote they know about Socrates before they come in there uh, into, into, into class is the idea that um, uh, the unexamined life is not worth living. But Socrates says that in order to live the examined life, you have to discuss virtue every day. And a lot of students, when you ask them, what did he mean by that? They think that he's talking about how to live so that you'll live a happy life. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, for me, the more persuasive way of reading the unexamined life line by Socrates is that it's about living a life which is striving to do no harm, as the medical oath goes. The only way to avoid, he says, what's worse, death or wickedness? And he says, wickedness is worse. And the way you avoid wickedness is by discussing virtue every day. And that just means having discussions about ethics and politics and social justice every day so that when a crisis comes along, you don't, you know, the average person doesn't find themselves doing wickedness, even though they, mm -hmm. they're not, they don't have a malicious intent, but that's how the structures then uh, operate on their behalf. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, especially I think right now we're all the moral questions that were always there in the background are now much clearer. Like, how have I been getting my food, right? That was a question we could have asked, but now we all are a little bit, um, I think, clearer on it and the necessity of thinking about those issues um, and how they relate to the well-being of others. Yeah, especially since a lot of people are risking their life to shop yes. for my food. <laughs> yes, yeah, right. Right. Well, thank you so much for your time reflecting on these issues. And um, I, you know, I'm sure we'll have time to uh, circle back around and talk more at a later date. Oh, that'd be great. It was great talking to you. Thank you.